Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to Garden Success. We look forward to talking to you today because that's what this show's about, a call-in show for you to ask questions. If you have something you want identified, uh, perhaps uh, you want to use our email. If you just want to call in and ask a question, you can do that too. Our phone number is 979-845-5689, 845-5689. You can reach me by email at gardensuccess at tamu. Dot edu. We definitely want to make sure that the emails are in good, sharp focus. In other words, uh, not blurry at all, that I can uh, zoom in on an email and look at, you know, maybe the details of some particular thing that you're showing in the picture. That would be helpful. And speaking of looking at the details that you're showing in the picture, uh, I got a, an email from Brian uh, about some St. Augustine that was declining. He sent a picture of the whole yard, and I see the declining that uh, is evident there from a distance. But when Brian took a picture up close, very good, sharp focus, thank you very much, I was able to discern the problem on his grass that I wouldn't have been able to see from a big, distant picture. And that problem is called gray leaf spot. Now, gray leaf spot is a fungal disease that attacks the grass blades. I might be able to attack stolons too. I don't think so. There's another disease that commonly attacks stolons. But anyway, it's the foliage that that, uh, you're concerned about. Uh, This disease loves uh, humid conditions. It loves shade. And it also loves... Uh, excessive amounts of nitrogen. And there are more than one grass issue on our St. Augustine grass that over-fertilizing can predispose your lawn uh, to this pro- these problems. For example, the brown, uh, used to call brown patch, now called large patch in our lawns. That typically, you see the big circles in fall. You can, of course, the, once they happen, they're going to be there all winter until it warms up and the grass grows new leaves. Uh, you can see some appearing in spring as well. But a large patch, if you fertilize a lot, and then we enter those cooler, rainier days of fall when it tends to uh, sh- show up as the big circles, uh, it's going to be worse. And also, uh, they show up better in a nice green lawn. <laughs> so that would be another issue maybe to consider. Uh, chinch bugs love succulent St. Augustine grass. And I, I would say that a chinch bug would take its chances crossing Texas Avenue at the busiest time of day to get to a nice lawn of St. Augustine. Uh, actually, that doesn't happen, but you get the idea. Uh, so over is a problem with that. Also, this g- disease, gray leaf spot, that's in your lawn, Brian, is a is an, a um, disease that uh, excessive nitrogen can predispose the lawn toward more of an issue with gray leaf spot. Uh, I often have used this statement before with people, but if you don't know what gray leaf spot looks like, go lay a piece of plywood on your lawn in the summer, leave it there for about a week and pick it up and you'll get to see what gray leaf spot looks like. So what have we done? Well, we've definitely shaded the grass. We definitely have increased the humidity by putting that plywood on top. We're kind of holding the moisture uh, in and around the grass blades and through the thatch and everything. And then uh, just giving it a little bit of time to develop. The disease is ubiquitous. It's it's out there in nature. It's not like a spore flew in from Timbuktu and landed on your grass. It is It is around, but when we create the the conditions that uh, it loves, then it's going to show up. And a lot of diseases are that way. In fact, and I realize I'm drifting off of your gray leaf spot here, Brian, but bear with me. A lot of diseases are essentially just opportunists looking for uh, the conditions they need. In fact, I would say all. Uh, I don't know if all is completely correct or not, because I don't know about every disease. You have to ask a Dr. Ong at the plant pathology department uh, in the, in the um, uh, disease lab about that. But diseases, for many, many fungal diseases, for example, uh, they can tell you that if a spore lands on this leaf of the susceptible plant 
and it has um, moisture on it for X number of hours within the temperature range of X to X, you get the idea, then that spore can germinate. So if it's too cool, it won't germinate. Uh, in many cases, if it's too hot, uh, if it doesn't have moisture. And that's one reason why we have more diseases in East Texas, or central to East Texas where we are, than you would out in West Texas, like San Angelo, for example, unless they just water their, with sprinklers a lot. Uh, it Spores need that. So the the way I, I said all of that to make a point, and this is true of fighting a lot of fungal diseases, don't give them what they like. So with with the gray leaf spot, watch the over fertilization and looking at your your yard in specific. I don't see signs of over fertilization, and it's and and that's just a reminder point that you don't. That's not the the cause of, of gray leaf spot, it just predisposes. But don't do that, uh, don't give them that. Uh, when we enter periods of rainy weather or if you irrigate a lot, uh, you can really create a, a, a gray leaf spot issue on your lawn. So I would say back off in the watering, um, if you have been watering a lot and uh, just uh, it, it will go away, but there are some fungicides you can use to, to fight it. There's a number of different fungicides that work that are labeled for your lawn that will work on gray leaf spot. Uh, you just have to go to a place that sells a good number of these, and you, you're going to find probably the, one of the biggest um, collections of all the fungicides, insecticides, herbicides, and everything in this region and at Producer Co-op. They, they're very good about carrying that. Uh, but find something that is labeled for the disease and then apply it according to the label. Don't mix it too strong. Uh, we always want to, you know, put a little bit more in there for so it kills the disease better. Well, the companies that make these products they have that research has been done to determine how much of the product needs to be applied. Now think about this. If you were a company selling a product, wouldn't you want to tell people to use a whole lot of it, right? You wouldn't tell them to use not quite enough because you're not going to sell as much product. Well, if they say on the label use this amount, that's the amount you use. And when you overdo it, uh, and I'm painting with a broad brush here, insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, all kinds of bad things can happen. So don't do that. Apply it according to the label. Uh, that just makes sense. And plus the label is law. Uh, so uh, apply fungicide to this. Again, I'm not going to go into all the fun fungicide ingredients or certainly not name, do brand names because that's uh, it's difficult to name all the different brands you may encounter. Uh, but that is what I would do at this stage. I expect that if you uh, back off on the irrigation, on, only doing it as needed, don't water to make this green again, um, I think it's going to go away for you. Now, you'll always have a little bit here and there, but not to the degree that you have it. Now, that was an awfully long answer to a simple question, but in in answering it, we were able to cover a lot of ground on some of the principles that will help us avoid problems. So for example, if you have an Indian hawthorn, let's use that as an example. There are a lot of those around here. They get a disease, fungal disease, called entomosporium leaf spot. If it is in the shade, if your pop-up uh, sprinklers are spraying the foliage all the time, uh, you're going to have a lot of entomosporium on an Indian hawthorn. Out in the sun, where it stays drier, you're going to have less. Now, you can still have a lot in the sun, but I'm just saying those conditions that predispose it make it worse. Uh, so that's something. Roses and black spot and powdery mildew, very environmentally affected. Uh, the moisture, the temperature, in the case of powdery mildew, high humidity, and a little bit cooler temperature, th that that's all part of the deal. So sometimes we're the ones that created the disease problem. The disease is out there. And that's something that I know a for a lot of folks is difficult to, to kind of get your head around. Uh, but here's an example of what I'm talking about. If you went to the side of your house in a shady spot and you had a little uh, sprinkler that just sprayed a mist of water against the bricks and you did that for about a week, you'd walk out there and you'd see algae growing on the brick of your house. Well, that's because you created the environment. Where was the al where did it come from? 
it's everywhere. It just, you created the conditions to make that disease proliferate. Uh, and so in answering, you know, a simple question on gray leaf spot, I, I just want to throw that out there because I think it will help a lot of people avoid problems. We always look for what is the spray that kills it. And what we should first do is say, what are the conditions that promote it? and fix that. And then there'll be times when you need to spray, but a lot, lot less as a result of that. Well, you're listening to Garden Line. I, I know better than droning on about a question, and that means people just listen, they don't call. So let me give you a phone number and you call with any kind of question you might have about plants, and that's 979-845-5689. 845-5689. Or by email at garden success at tamu dot edu. Garden success at tamu dot edu. I had a question come in from Elizabeth, and it is a picture of some Turks cap leaves. And if you look at the leaves, there's holes eaten in them. And the holes uh, kind of go all through irregularly through areas of the leaf, but when they hit a main vein or a main side vein, they stop there. And that is the, the work of either a caterpillar or a beetle. I uh, need more info to, and, and whatnot to be able to tell the which specifically it is, but uh, it's either a caterpillar or a beetle. My my guess on this one would that it would be a caterpillar. Uh, if you see little black uh, debris, very tiny, like, uh, I don't know, the head, head of a pin or maybe a little larger, black debris on the leaves underneath it, then that is a caterpillar. That's the, the uh, poop of the caterpillar. That's the technical term. Uh, so, what do you do? Well, uh, number one, turn some leaves over. See if you see some caterpillars under there. Uh, and if not, uh, then just kind of watch. Maybe pick a leaf or two or three and, and look at it one day and then come back and look at it the next day. Uh, that, that is so that you can determine, is this, are these caterpillars gone? Are they now moths flying around or, or whatever? Did birds eat them or something else? Uh, paper wasp haul them away? And if no new, fo no new damage occurs, nothing to do at this point. If, on the other hand, you're seeing new damage occurring, then you would want to use a product that contains BT, uh, which stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. BT uh, is the safest product for caterpillars. You can also use a product called Spinosad, S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D. There are many, many brands of Spinosad and BT, uh, but either one of those, Elizabeth, should take care of your Turk's cap. Well, we're going to go to the phones. Again, the number 979-845-5689, and we're going to talk to Syed. Uh, hello, Syed. Uh, hi, how are you, Skip? I'm well, thank you. Good. Skip, i uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I sent you an email with some pictures of my roses uh, that have got now brown leaves, and it's coming. Actually, I've got three pots on my back patio. Uh, two of them are doing pretty poorly, and one which is not very far from it is just in perfect health. Uh, I'm sure you have addressed it in the last uh, uh, program, but I couldn't listen to you because I was away and had something to do, and I just missed it. And I just caught the last part of your answer to the previous question, and uh, you were describing all sorts of diseases. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to repeat the whole thing and take your time, but yes. is that something that uh, and these uh, roses are having the same problem that you were describing as the fungus uh, well, is doing this? It is going to be environmentally connected. Syed, I cannot find that I received that email. Could you resend it right away, and I'll try to answer it before the end of the day. How about that? I really need to see some pictures. Okay, I will. I will do that. Uh, right. I can send it to the same number that uh, I'm using it now to address you. Gar no, you send the picture to Garden Success by email. Garden Success at okay. at t a m u dot e d u. Uh, garden success at tamu dot e d u and attach it to your email. Don't embed it in the text of your email. Okay, okay I will. I will just. Okay, I will send that those pictures to you right away. All right. Very good. Thanks Thank for you. the call. Bye-bye. Yes, bye -bye. sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. So uh, 
We had a, a question come in from Needville. That's a little distance out there. Uh, it has a two- to three-year-old Haas avocado tree in a pot. It's been a few hours inside a hot vehicle, and 25% of the leaves are wilted. The tree and fruit are doing fine. Um, hmm. Can I trim the dead, dying leaves right now, or is there something else to rehab? No, uh, you can trim them off if you want, but just wait. They're going to fall off if they're not going to make it. Uh, just have to tell you, though, the Haas avocado is not a variety that we grow here. Uh, so I always tell people that if, if you're planting an avocado tree that produces dark, bumpy fruit with a thick rind, that's not for here. The Mexican avocados that have very thin skin and tend to be green even when they're ready to go, uh, that is the kind that has the best chance of surviving in uh, the freezes that can happen uh, in the this region and south. I, I would not, in general, recommend avocados just because they're not dependable enough, but if you're willing to go through some effort to protect them in the winter, uh, if, uh, several varieties of Mexican avocado can do do really well here. Uh, I'm trying to think of some varieties off the top of my head, but I think a Wilma and Joey is two. There are s several other good ones, and the horticulture department has a publication on avocados. If you go to the Aggie Horticulture website, uh, just do a search for Aggie Horticulture, and uh, go to the there's a button on the front page for fruit, and you'll get a publication on the next click just for avocados. So that is what I would suggest for that. Uh, let's see, we had a question come in. Um, let's see, I, I tell you what, let me go to this one first. Uh, William sends a picture of a bug, uh, and it, it is a leaf-footed bug. And the interesting thing about leaf-footed bugs, well, first of all, leaf-footed bugs and stink bugs, they're kind of like kissing cousins. They, they belong to the same family and group and everything in the insect world. They have piercing-sucking mouth parts, and they are not afraid to use them on your plants. Uh, you you probably most often encounter their damage on a tomato as yellow little yellowish whitish hard spots on the on the tomato. Uh, you can find peaches, for example, that are all dimpled in because they fed on the peach when it was a very small green peach, uh, and they they cause other kinds of problems, uh, other plant problems as as well as those. Uh, the the neat, unique thing about leaf-footed bug, and this is how you separate it from, uh, actually there, there are some beneficial bugs that, that can look a lot like uh, young leaf-footed bugs, uh, but an adult leaf-footed bug has a big, flat, splayed spot on its hind leg. And if you use your imagination, it'd be like there's a little piece of leaf on their leg or in their leg. Uh, so that is the leaf-footed bug. Once they reach the adult stage, they're tough to control. You got to use some of the more uh, powerful insecticides to control them. And uh, when they are in the adult stage, they have wings and they can fly around. So you're spraying over here for one, then you go over there and spray for one. It's just not a very efficient way to approach it. Learn what they look like when they hatch out. They're little orangish red bugs with black legs. They're not the only orangish red bug with black legs. There's also beneficial ones like that. But the bad uh, stink bugs and leaf-footed bugs, they tend to stay in a herd when they're really, really young. You'll see a whole group of them together on a leaf. The beneficial bugs tend to disperse uh, more uh, quickly on the leaf. And so if you see them, you just swat it with your hand and knock them into a little pail of water you're holding underneath the, the plant. And that way, they don't have wings, can't fly away, and you have a whole bunch of them in one place. That's the most efficient way to control them. You can also do sprays uh, as well. But once they hit that stage, I think these uh, William, were on William's uh, some squash and cucurbits, cu cucumber family plants. And so that that's kind of what I would say by now. I've known people that have little vacuums that they use to just um, vacuum them up off the leaf. Uh, you can do that if you're pretty quick you might catch an adult and be able to get it in there uh, but there's so many that are coming in for now that they have wings coming in from other areas and it's uh, areas of your landscape and garden it's, it's kind of difficult to to stay up with it uh, using a vacuum type technique but for a home garden that that is possible uh, another email uh, came in uh, from uh, let's see I believe this one was from a uh, well, I'll get to it in a minute. Uh, and it is a elm tree that 
uh, the tree itself has a lot of long vertical dead areas on the on the trunk uh, and when when you see that kind of thing uh, it's an indication that there has been probably coal damage but it could even be a lightning strike uh, that is on the trunk by the way this is from Ann uh, and in this case I think it's definitely coal damage this is on a Chinese elm uh, and we did get some coal damage on Chinese elms in this past December. As a matter of fact, uh, there was some, but we also had it in the February freeze of uh, 21. And uh, that type of damage, if it's minor, the tree heals back over it. Uh, I shouldn't use the word heal. The tree callus closes back over that wound that was made, and it goes on fine. In this case, the amount of damage is so significant that it's going to take a long time to restore that bark cover, the healthy living bark cover around the tree itself. I would seriously think about taking that out. I see a lot of sprouts coming out from the bottom, or at least what appears to be elm sprouts. Yes, they are elm sprouts. And um, that, I guess it would be possible to get rid of all of them, but one, and regrow the trunk out of that. I would probably do that in stages, maybe leave five initially and tip three of them. You know, take your pruners and cut the last oh, foot out of those shoots. Uh, and that will kind of dwarf them a little bit. And the two or two or three that you leave grow on and then do that again in a few weeks. You, you know, what you're doing is you're hedging your bed here just a little bit and you're leaving leaves on the tree so that it has a way to make carbohydrates while it goes through this very stressful transition of having lost the whole top part almost. Uh, anyway, when they get a certain size, then uh, you can cut all of them off but one. Uh, I'll probably before the end of the year do that. And uh, I would leave the existing tree. It's not going to, it's not in a state where decay could have hit a point where it would be gone. Uh, but you leave it for now and, and take it out uh, once this other one gets going pretty good. Uh, that that is the best I can do based on the photos, and I you know a photo can't show everything that's there, but that's that's how I would assess that one. And our phone number is nine seven nine eight four five fifty six eighty nine eight four five five six eight nine, or by email at garden success at tamu dot edu. Garden success at tamu dot edu. A uh, question came in from Becky. Uh, she receives, uh, I'll just avoid some names here. Uh, she receives a weekly newsletter uh, from a horticulturist that uh, says fertilized turf grass with the second feed, with its second feeding now of a high nitrogen or all nitrogen fertilizer with half or more of the nitrogen in slow release form. It's critical that it be fed soon, uh, but do it before it turns really, really hot. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, if you do it after it turns hot, it increases the chances of gray leaf spot. <laughs> hey, where have we heard that? Uh, so this person fertilized, and our Becky fertilized in mid-April. Uh, good time to fertilize here, Becky, in most years. And uh, so the question is, do we invest in more? Well, you have options. There are lawns that are almost never fertilized. They are a chartreuse green rather than a healthy green. They are typically kind of thin, but the grass survives. There are people that fertilize four times a year. Uh, I think that's excessive, uh, but the key is not just how many times do you fertilize, but how much do you put on when you fertilize. So if you use a pound of nitrogen four times a year, that's a lot for St. Augustine. Too much. Uh, but if you uh, you know apply a small amount to that each time, well, then that that will be okay. I I recommend slow release fertilizers in the summertime, and there are a number of good products out there. Again, I'm not going to get into recommending products here, but the the um, slow release fertilizers uh, that are quality, and they're going to cost you a little bit more, uh, but they release that nitrogen very slowly over time because they it's in a a type of chemistry that breaks down very, very slow. 
And so I, if you want to use one of those, you're probably going to get 12 to 16 weeks of, of a nutrient release on it. If you will return your clippings, that is a lot of nutrient right there. And so if you didn't want to purchase more fertilizer right now, and you've already done it, uh, I suspect what you did the first time was a quick release. Uh, and then just return your clippings. Your lawn's going to be okay. But take a look at your lawn. Is it too thin? Do you need it to really fill in pretty soon? It's, it's, you're going to get a lot more weed problems. Well, then I would do the fertilization now. If everything is growing fine and looks lush and happy, you can hold off. You can wait. But do return those clippings. It takes some time to decompose, but they will release a significant amount of nutrients back into the soil. I hope that's helpful with that, uh, Becky. By the way, that... Uh, newsletter you get from that horticulture is extremely good, extremely informative. Uh, let's see. I had a question come in. Well, I'm going to have to wait on that one. I can read it a little bit. Uh, here we go. By the way, a lot of these emails are old ones. Um, I Last week, something happened and I wasn't getting emails in last week, so um, I would... Uh, just bear with me. I've got a whole lot of these that I would like to be able to get to. Uh, so if uh, uh, this goes back to Ann's thing with the tree, if you want to get rid of the suckers and try to keep the main tree, yes, you should cut all the shoots back as close to where they're attaching uh, to whatever they're attaching to, probably the base of the trunk, as possible. Uh, just get as close as you can, uh, and that would be really helpful. Lots of inform lots of questions on the email this week. Uh, something is feeding on the base of some green bean plants, and the question is, what is doing that? Uh, there are also some pill bugs on the uh, plant, and yes, those are these are pill bugs. There's pill bugs and sow bugs. They look somewhat similar. Pill bugs. My my take on them, and I'm not a professional entomologist, is my take on them is the flat ones, what I call sow bugs, and the ones that that are round that tend to roll up in the ball, roly polies. Those would be the pill bugs. Uh, I cannot tell what was feeding on that. The the pill bugs did not cause the damage that you see in those pictures that I see in the pictures that you sent. Something else caused that damage, and now they're in there feeding on it. Uh, pill bugs will feed on some plants, but that particular type of damage I don't believe is that. So I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, I just would, you know, beans uh, have their season. And as it is heating up, those beans are going to not be producing uh, very much. Uh, looking at the plant, it it's the question is about beans, but I'm, yeah, that, that's definitely what it is. So anyway, I would wait. I think those plants are going to be heading out pretty soon. Uh, will it, and those bugs will stay around in the soil. The, the pill bugs will. Uh, but I wouldn't really worry about them. In general, they're not a problem and not something we have to treat uh, for on our vegetables. Uh, let's see. Our phone number is 979-845-5689. 845 or by email at garden Success at tamu dot edu garden success at tamu dot edu let's go back to the phones now and we're going to talk to bobby joe hello bobby joe hello mr victor i'm so glad i found your show and i have recommended it to a few friends so we've all enjoyed it well, thank you. Um, and for all the listeners, that cost me a $20 bill to have her call in and say that. So, <laughs> Well, um, the, one of the shows I listened to on the podcast um, talked about trees and planting. I have moved from Lee County sandy soil to McLennan County clay soil, and I planted trees. Mm -hmm. And the most enlightening thing that you told me that I'm not doing right is... Um, get the grass away from the bottom of the tree. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to know, I've got Bermuda grass. I put mulch around the trees, and, of course, Bermuda grass took it over. Mm -hmm. Now, my thinking, only thing that I can think to do is put a um, thick layer of cardboard with mulch on top of that to kill the Bermuda grass out. Well, it the, the Bermuda grass that you cover it will prevent any light from getting to it and it won't survive in the spot underneath the cardboard, at least if the cardboard stays there six months or so. 
Uh, mm-hmm. But it will crawl around and come up all around the sides and, you know, up against the trunk of the tree between the cardboard and the tree trunk. What I would do on it uh, is I, I would use a product that is for grass to kill grass. And so mm-hmm. that there there are a couple of ingredients out there uh, that there is... I don't know if you want the long words of ingredients, but sethoxidem is one. S e t. Just look for something that starts off S e t h d o x. And another one is fluazofop, and that it just look for something that says F l u a z i. Uh, and those two kill grass, but not not brought most broadleaf weeds. So they're used in flower beds and things like that. And I think it would be a good choice right here to get rid of that. And you're, but you're gonna if it's coming in from out in the yard, then you're gonna constantly be fighting it because it always invades, and it thinks mm-hmm. any territory it doesn't currently occupy is its territory. And I've not ever found a uh, border that goes eight inches deep where you could block it out with a border either. Right, and I don't know on Bermuda if eight inches would do it. It my my unprofessional opinion is it probably would, but um, that's yeah. Yes, you're right. Yeah, they're the they're not. Yeah, they're, they're not, not borders made. Borders are made for the top of the ground grass, uh, just for weeding it at, at at the border and keeping it from crawling over the border and whatnot. So, yeah, there's not a good one. It's just that's that is one of the biggest negatives of Bermuda grass in a home garden, a home landscape that I can think of. Uh, it can make a beautiful lawn in the right conditions and with the right mowing schedule, but it also uh, is just invasive. And zoysia, yeah. a lot of the zoysias will be invasive in a similar way. Yes. Okay, the next question about that is, I have not been able to stick my finger down in clay soil. <laughs> it's like a brick. Mm-hmm. So I I cannot figure out how to water these. In the sandy soil, it was so easy to water. You knew what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. But with the clay, it's like, I don't know how much to water. Yeah. And I know about the size of the root ball of the tree, but it's like a little tub down there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, when was this tree planted? Last year. Last year. Okay. Well, the roots are going to be going out beyond the little mulched area that you made for it. So you can water a large area gradually, very gradually. There are devices made for putting on the end of a garden hose and watering around the base of a tree. Some of them, you can turn them up and they water a much larger area. Uh, so if you just want to water a tree and not necessarily the grass, then that that would be an option. Uh, the, the only trick I can think of, Bobby Joe, on on watering and we use this in in turf sometimes is if you take a uh, like a flathead screwdriver and a long handled one we're not talking about a little one but a very long Mm -hmm. one and you push it in the ground uh, you can tell how deep the soil has been wet from an irrigation because on the top it just goes through kind of like through butter I mean Mm -hmm. it's, it's clay is dense but it's soft when it's wet and uh, when you push it down and suddenly it's like you hit a concrete (laughs) pad under there you can pull it out and look at how long that is and that's how deep the wet zone has gone and so maybe that would be a good general guide if you can and and you don't want to do this very often uh, you don't need to do this very often but whenever it hadn't rained for a while give it a really good soaking where you could push a screwdriver, you know, at least 10 inches down into the soil. That is a good deep wetting and it's going to take time and it's going to take more than one irrigation because clay can't absorb the water fast enough. Uh, Not nearly as fast as even an efficient uh, irrigation system puts it out. So that, that would be my suggestion, but we have not hit the kind of temperatures nor had the lack of rainfall that would really warrant a wetting on a tree that's been in for almost a year okay well that's very helpful and i um, hope to be at the event on uh saturday at dig i want to see that so. yeah that is good and you reminded me I'm, I'm gonna talk about some local activities here and i'll mention that thank you susan i appreciate right. or susan bobby joe i appreciate that call all right thank you mm-hmm. bye-bye bye-bye yeah going on around town uh this saturday 
the Brazos County Master Gardener Association is having an open day at their DIG. The DIG stands for Demonstration Idea Garden. Uh, this is up on Highway 21 in Bryan. So if you are, let's say, Texas Avenue, you're heading west on 21, like you're going to go to Caldwell, uh, it's almost when you get out there to 2818. It's, it's way, way west but not on the other side, 2018. The specific number is 2619 Highway 21 in West Bryan. You'll see a sign there, and if you look to your left, if you're heading from Texas out that way, heading west, it'll be on the left, uh, then you will see the garden. Now, why go there? Well, uh, number one, the dig is a really cool demonstration garden that the master gardeners built and still maintain out there. Uh, you can stroll through the gardens, look around. You can ask questions of the master gardeners and see see what they do, what they what their experience with a plant or how they planted something or what would be good for this kind of area, uh, what attracts uh, maybe butterflies, for example, those kind of questions. Uh, you can see how they make compost out there. You can talk to master gardeners that will be uh, uh, answering questions about the rainwater harvesting system that they have out there. There is a Texas Superstars Garden, which promotes AgriLife Extension Texas Superstar Plants, Extension and Research Superstar Plants. Uh, you can look at plants that grow in shady areas. There's a little vegetable garden. You get the idea. Lots, lots of information. They even have a butterfly garden that's a monarch uh, way station. And uh, let's see, the, if you go out there, this is on Saturday, June 10th from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. And it's free to the public. And kids are certainly welcome. Bring them out there and let them experience gardening. And I think it, it will be a really nice uh, outing uh, that does really well here. There's a little arboretum out there where they planted some varieties of trees, species that, that grow really well here. So that is next Saturday, June the 10th. Now on Wednesday following that, June 14th, the Rio Brazos Audubon Society is going to have a program at the Brazos Valley Museum of Natural History. Uh, that will be at 6.30 p.m. That Museum of Natural History is on Briarcrest Drive. So if you're heading east of the bypass, Highway 6, uh, you go a little further out and it'll be on the right. Uh, Briarcrest Drive, the Rio Brazos Audubon Society. Now, four members are going to present some short talks. One of them will be on Laredo Birding Festival in a nutshell, that kind of a report on what happens there. Uh, another one on the forever chemicals, the per and polyfluoroalkyl substances in birds and marine animals. Now, that's probably got your, your uh, curiosity up. That's a, a big topic right now. And finally, there'll be a, a, a talk on the quest for the harpy and the birds at the park at Glen Arbor. For more information, Rio Brazos Audubon, all one word, riobrazosaudubon.org. Go one more Saturday out. That's a week from this Saturday, June 17th. The Master Gardeners are presenting another of their Learning at the Library programs. This is from 10 to 11 a.m. at the Clara Mounts Public Library on at 201 East 26th Street in Bryan. Wanda Stewart, one of our master gardeners and a retired elementary teacher, will be talking about gardening with children. She's going to talk about her insights, good gardening books, gardening activities for children of different ages. Uh, this is a talk that if you are a parent, uh, if you're a grandparent, uh, this is an opportunity. The way we like to put it is let's grow some future gardeners. I think that certainly is a good thing for children to learn for sure. Now there's a rumor that there may be a giveaway or two, so that would be another reason to come. It's free. It's open to the public. If you want more information, call Janelle at 209-5623. So that's 979-209-5623. And that is a lot of what's happening. I think there was another thing I was going to mention. Stuff coming up. Oh, just a reminder. Each Wednesday and Friday, the Aggie Horticulture Facebook Live events are broadcast at 1 p.m. So this is an opportunity to view live and pre-recorded short, short talks on gardening topics. I've done a number of those over the last couple, two or three years myself. Uh, and uh, the specialists from the Hort Department uh, are, are giving these talks as well. Uh, that They do most of the talks. 
and uh, they just have a wealth of information. Like when recently Dr. Hartman was talking about uh, how to prune blackberries. This is a time where you're pinch pinching your upright new blackberry shoots. Uh, and he kind of goes through the whole thing. It's really cool. You can watch past episodes, too, uh, if you would like. Uh, so I'm not going to read the long URL out, but if you go to aggiehorticulture.tamu.edu slash fblive, that will get you there. Uh, so you can also just do a search uh, as well on Facebook for that. Lots of good, all kinds of good information. Uh, I know Lisa Wettelsey has more than once done talks on uh, decorating uh, for certain holiday events or decorating with, mater with materials from the garden and things. Uh, just a wide variety of, of good opportunities to learn. And they're short, so you're not sitting there watching a long, long thing. They're probably about, I, mean, I don't know, 15 minutes on average, something like that. I believe that's about what they're running now. I had a question from Susan come in by email. By the way, our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689, uh, or by email gardensuccess at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U, gardensuccess at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. Uh, Susan had a question on uh, a plant that she has, uh, a, a wad of white webbing, and there was a big spider inside, and wants to know uh, what what is it, and uh, you know what do we what do we do about it? Uh, so that that is a spider nest. There's there's a number of different kinds of spiders, to say the least. Uh, some spiders, like Charlotte's web, uh, they build this web that bugs flying by get caught in, and that is one type of spider. There are spiders that have nests that are in the ground. Uh, the black widow will create a nest in a hole in the ground, for example. Uh, and then there's there's other structures that spiders build. This would probably have been where the spider had some eggs at one point, or maybe it was about to lay eggs. Uh, and so none of these spiders are things that we need to kill. Uh, the, the black widow and the brown recluse are the two main things here, spider-wise, that you know we definitely want to stay away from. You're not going to typically encounter either of those up on a plant in the garden or in the landscape. Like I said, black widow is going to be down on the ground or in a hole. Uh, brown recluse, I don't even know what their natural habitat is, but they get in our houses, and that's where we can encounter them too in there. So uh, I would ignore them. All spiders that we are dealing with in, in these kinds of questions are predators. So they're capturing other things to feed it to their young. By the way, there's a cool spider here called the green lynx spider. Uh, lynx like the cat-like wild animal. Uh, green lynx. Now it creates a web, uh, just a real clunky, dirty web of debris from the plant, I say detritus from the plants and things, underneath a leaf typically, uh, and it raises its young in there, and it then runs out and runs all over the place looking for things to capture and eat and bring back. So that's uh, what you're looking at there, uh, Susan. Our phone number, 979-845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu garden success at t a m u dot e d u i got the pictures i had called earlier about and i'm looking at those i had those are uh, when you see the tips and edges of a leaf turning brown that is an indication of a water problem now we can cause that by over fertilizing with a salt based fertilizer and it it goes through the system and the last place it can go is out toward the ends and edges of the leaf where you know it's evaporating away and it's leaving the salt behind kind of like if you were to boil uh, uh, college station brine water uh, in a little container till it was all gone you would have some some stuff on the bottom that was minerals that were in that water uh, and so that that is causing probably the burning. It can be caused by a lack of, of soil moisture, or it could also be caused by um, a um, periodic drought uh, that could cause it. Uh, you could also cause it uh, by uh, leaving it too soggy for a while and roots die, and then you don't have the roots to take up moisture. Uh, so I see, I see those. See a little bit on there that 
uh, it doesn't look like a virus, but it almost looks like some sort of a herbicide was put on somewhere around it. And I realize this is in a container, so that probably is not the case. Uh, but a little bit of that, the, the bleaching of the veins, kind of a yellow color, might be what you're looking at there. So I had, for right now, uh, I would probably stick my hand down in the container and see if it's wet, too wet, and, and just kind of moderate your watering uh, according to the soil moisture in that container. Uh, and hopefully the amount, of, if there was damage, the amount is not too severe. If you wanted to lean it over, kind of bump the sides of the pot and gradually, carefully slide that plant out of the container just to look at the roots around the outside of that root cylinder. Uh, you might see some brown water soap decaying roots, uh, in which case you definitely need to let it dry out a little bit. And then there are some fungicides you can drench to shut down uh, some types of root rots that might be affecting it. Well, you're listening to Garden Line, and if you would like to give us a call, our phone number is uh, Garden Line. <laughs> Garden Success. You know, I knew to, I knew to do that one day. Uh, Garden Success. <laughs> our phone number, if you'd like to give us a call, 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email, gardensuccess at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U, gardensuccess at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. Edu, lot of stuff going on by email today. Uh, let's see. William had a picture of a bug that was a leaf-footed bug, and I was talking about that earlier. The leaf-footed bugs and the stink bugs and the damage that they do, and you need a stronger product to control them. And the question was, could you do it with soap? And the answer is no. Um, if insects are very small and soft-bodied, soap can be effective. As they get a little bit older, it's kind of a stage where it just irritates them, <laughs> it doesn't kill them. Uh, and then there's a stage where they're almost not affected at all. And uh, so soap would not be a good one for leaf-footed bugs unless you sprayed them when they first came out of the eggs. And they're little bitty tiny leaf-footed bugs. Soap might work pretty good on that. I've never tried it and it wouldn't be the one that I would recommend at that stage uh, if you were going to go after them in that way. Well, now that it's heating up, and boy, is it ever going to heat up this week, we've got some some really significant warmth that, um, you know, you kind of always hope it delays as much. You know it's coming, but you always hope that it delays as much as possible. Uh, this is a good time to plant things that like the heat, that can take the heat. Um, that would be melons like cantaloupe and honeydew and watermelon. They can take the heat that we're in right now. Uh, lots of good summer greens uh, that uh, Malabar and amaranth and mulakia and uh, let's see, purslane, vegetable types of amaranth and purslane uh, can certainly take this heat. Uh, squashes that take a long time are winter squashes like a butternut squash, a pumpkin, for example, or a uh, spaghetti squash, another good example. Those could be planted now. Just watch and take care of that foliage. Powdery mildew and certain other diseases can just really wipe it out. And without foliage, you can't make carbohydrates. Without carbohydrates, you can't make a spaghetti squash or a pumpkin or a butternut squash or any of the other things we grow the plants to produce. Sweet potatoes, if you can find a source of some sweet potato slips, can still be planted now. It's okay for that. Uh, and then, of course, southern peas. Southern peas... Uh, just really love the heat. And that would be black-eyed peas, purple hull peas, crowder peas, cream peas, uh, yard-long beans, same kind of plant, uh, but with real long, long uh, uh, pods. Uh, by the way, just a little... Uh, this bugs me soapbox. There's a lot of those in horticulture, by the way. Uh, but we, we call things beans that... Uh, maybe should have been called peas, but we really call things peas that should have been called beans. Uh, like our southern peas are not a true pea. Uh, the uh, yard-long bean, notice the same family, same kind of fruit, uh, just longer. Uh, we call that a bean. We should, we should call black-eyed peas black-eyed beans. Uh, it's different than your typical green, bush green bean, but um, I don't like using the term pea because they're not in that family. Like uh, for now, true peas would be uh, snow peas, sugar snap peas, uh, and the English peas, the ones we shell out and eat the seeds from. Those are all peas. Okay, that complaint session is over. Uh, okra 
can't have summer garden without okra. Okra does really, really well in the heat. That would be a really good one to do. And if you want to plant eggplant or, or peppers, you can. You're probably not going to see a lot of fruit until fall, but just work really hard at getting as big a plant as you can, because that way you can hang a lot of fruit on it. Uh, that's kind of a different way to think about it, but that's the way I think about it. Uh, if you go into fall and you got a small plant, can't have that many peppers on it. If you have a big plant, you, it's kind of like a Christmas tree, I guess. Uh, you, the more bigger your tree, the more ornaments you can hang on it. Well, let's go to the phones, the number 845-5689, uh, and we're going to talk to Garrett. Uh, hello, Garrett. Hey, Skip. Uh, I have a question about um, cucumbers. All right. So I saw uh, somewhere online, it wasn't anywhere you know, too reputable, I think it was a YouTube video, uh, the guy was saying that if you let a cucumber uh, fruit come to maturity, or, or uh, the the actual like um, the actual cucumber mm -hmm. fully mature on a plant, that that's going to reduce the productivity of the plant and and kind of stop it in its tracks. I was wondering if there's any truth in that. Like, do I need to be picking all the cucumbers off before they get too big? Uh. There probably is. Uh, there are a number of things that leaving the fruit on the plant diminishes future production. And, and I, peppers are one of the best examples. Uh, I like red peppers because they have a lot more beta carotene in them and they're a little sweeter than a green pepper. So even my jalapenos, I'll let go red. Not always, but sometimes. And But that does reduce the productivity of the bush because a lot more energy is going into that. Uh, I've never heard that on cucumbers, but I believe it. That that sounds sounds right to me. Uh, but uh, I I don't know why you would you would leave a cucumber on a bush because it definitely loses quality once it get gets past that young tender stage. Uh, on, I said a bush, yeah. a vine, is it? Right. Yeah. I well, I actually was out of town for a week and kind of like a, not a very kind of a critical time it seems like in the garden and I came back and I had all these mature cucumbers and uh that I should have probably picked before I left and yeah my plants aren't looking that good so yeah. I don't know if now they kind of peter out anyways or if that's the cause yeah that they're it's getting too warm for them to set fruit and that's just the case I would say if you want to get back into cucumbers mid-july to mid-august would be a good time to start seeds to get the plants up and growing. I'd do it under a little bit of a shade cover, something just to sort of block the sun, make the soil not so terribly hot. Uh, and that will give you a nice fall production of cucumbers when it cools off a little bit. Sure. Did you say that was July? Yeah, mid-July to mid-August. And it depends on what kind of cucumbers you're growing. Uh, I usually aim for some that are in about the 50... 45, 50, 55 day range from planting to maturity. So, mm -hmm. for example, if you did something, we'll just split that time frame and say you did something on August 1st, that'd be September 1st, uh, you know, kind of early October that they would be ripening. Uh, but if you go 45 days, then you're going to have something ripening a little earlier than that. Okay. And I have one last real quick question about solarizing. Uh, Around what time are you, uh, you know, do, do we need to think about, like, putting out plastic and solarizing the, the soil? Uh, now's a good time. Uh, okay. Yeah, watch the weather. If we've got a bunch of rainstorms coming, just hold off a little bit. Uh, but uh, solarizing, you want the hottest, sunniest time of the year. And, it, and it, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it's the sun's rays that do all the work in solarizing. And so that's why uh, we want to get it out in that blazing, blazing hot summertime. Uh, and so it's going to take about six weeks, four to six weeks maybe, for the sun to do its work uh, in order to feel pretty good about the soil. Just remember, Garrett, when you're solarizing a garden area, you want to do everything you're going to do to the soil before you solarize. That would be mixing in com uh, compost or mixing in fertilizer or building raised beds or anything like that. Because after you solarize, you do not want to mess with the soil because it doesn't work very mm -hmm. deep. And so if you rototilled after you fertilized, you would just be bringing stuff from down low back up to the surface. Okay. Yep. Thank you. All right. Yeah, that's, that's great information. I think I might uh, get started on that then. All right. Well, good luck with it.
All right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for the information. You bet. Thank you for the call. Appreciate that. The phone number, uh, I think we could do a quick one uh, right now. We've got about three minutes. That's 845-5689, 845-5689. And I have finally caught up on all those emails, I believe, that uh, people had emailed me before. Uh, We just finally got back to being able to look at them and see the questions. And by the way, on emails, I'm... I'm in the studio for a very short time each Thursday, and so I try to do the emails when I'm here for the show. Uh, Just, you know, the more email accounts you get, it's kind of like the, what, the little Dutch boy standing in front of the dike, and it leaks, and he sticks a finger in it, and then another leak appears, and he sticks a hole in it. (laughs) You remember the days when someone would get a hold of you, they had to walk through the door or call you on the phone? Well, now with email and all the other technologies. Uh, it's just kind of hard to keep up with everything. So I, I do these garden success emails. I do those uh, here on the on the show it, itself. So if you don't hear from me uh, for a while, that, that is exactly what is going on. Uh, I had a, a question, uh, very interesting by the way, a uh, question came in about um, the yellow areas in St. Augustine. And uh, you may notice that in your yard, the grass, and this is an early spring thing, it's, it's something you see more as we warm up a little bit, but the grass starts to turn yellow and then eventually just dies out. And that is, from a visual stand back and look at it standpoint, that is a real classic take all root rot. Now, d- diagnosing that disease without taking a closer look uh, is not a good idea, but I would, number one, go looking to see if that disease is present, killing the roots. Uh, And that has been one that's plagued us here. Uh, Good quality turf management principles are important. Uh, Anything that stresses the grass, shade, for example. Uh, Soil compaction stresses the grass. Drought, uh, it may survive the drought, but it weakens the grass and then the grass is susceptible, especially if we move into fall when take all does its infection and also in the spring, uh, some infection. And so you wanna avoid those stresses. Another one that's a biggie is a weed killer injury. There are weed killers that prevent the grass from getting a root down in the ground. They're pre-emergent types. And there are weed killers that are post-emergent broadleaf that when the temperature goes above the upper 80s, let's say, or definitely into the 90s, uh, you can get damaged to your St. Augustine. It may yellow a little bit, or it just may be stressed. And then take all root rot suddenly becomes a problem. Remember how we started the show? Well, that's how we're ending it, in that you predispose your plants to diseases and you have problems. You avoid weakening the plants. You avoid the environmental conditions, moisture, humidity, and temperature. You can't control temperature uh, that that um, make the disease happy and you end up with disease problems. Well, that's it for today. We'll be back again next Thursday answering your garden questions. Don't forget, you can listen to past shows online at the KAMU-FM website, or you can subscribe to Garden Success on your podcast app and listen to past shows that way as well. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.